Hello, everybody. My name is Bruce Montgomery, and this is my colleague, Tracy Priest. Hello, everybody. And we're with The Road to Retail. On our podcast, Tracy and I hope to offer tips, insights, ideas, and examples for how small, emerging, and challenger consumer packaged goods brands, CPG, can build their businesses. Everything from determining if you're ready to grow, where to start, how to prove it online, and we're going to talk a lot about that today, to how to go about securing distribution at a national retailer, driving your business through to the consumer, and how to go about finding an investor if that's something that you're ready for. The bottom line, Tracy and I have been doing this for a long time. We've made a lot of mistakes. We've also done some good things. And if we can help smooth out your journey on the road to retail, we would love to help. Tracy? Yes, as Bruce mentioned, we are, uh, we've got 30 plus years of experience. And what we mean by commercial operations is uh, sales, marketing, trade marketing, acquisitions and divestitures, managing brokers, managing agencies, manning, managing distributors. So we've done, we've done it all. And as Bruce mentioned, our really intent here for our podcast today is to share with you uh, insights and key learnings from you know, our past experiences and hopefully help you avoid some of the mistakes and enjoy some of the successes that we've had throughout our career. Also on our podcast, we invite colleagues, friends, industry experts onto our show to share with you also their, their insights and experiences. So Bruce, tell uh, our audience today who we have with us. Great, thank you, Tracy. So today we're fortunate to have Jason Omen, the head of uh, the VP of e-commerce at Market Performance Group, MPG. And Jason's going to spend some time with us today, giving you a very deep dive uh, into Amazon and what goes on there. Jason, before we dive in, why don't you give a little bit more uh, on your background and how you got to the seat you're in right now, please? Of course. Hey, first of all, thanks for having me, guys. I'm honored to be a part of your podcast and um, excited to have this conversation. Um, how did I get where I am today? Good question. Uh, I think I'll go back a, a quick, long history and then then focus some on the last sort of eight years. I uh, I've worked kind of sounds like you guys, lots of different places. Uh, I've run BD. I've worked for large, you know, billion dollar companies and tech startups. Um, great experiences all the way around. And um, about, geez, 13 years ago. One of my friends from one of those tech startups called me up uh, and told me I had to stop what I was doing and sell stuff on Amazon. Um, I should have listened to him. Um, <laughs> I was busy uh, trying to turn some small startup into something amazing. And I was like, oh, I'm too busy. I can't do it. And uh, this is back in about 2010 uh, when life was a little different on Amazon. I'll get back to that a little bit later. Um, fast forward about five more years. I decided to throw my hat in the ring and, and try and build my own brands and sell my own products on Amazon. So for a lot of people that watch your podcast, I understand the pain of, of uh, figuring out how to succeed on Amazon. Uh, mm -hmm. Through that experience, we um, you know launched two brands. And uh, fortunately for me, I would say, I live kind of in the belly of the beast here in Seattle, Washington. Um, I would say half my neighbors work in Amazon. And uh, in conversations with one of my friends um, over the course of about a year, we decided uh, to launch some private label product because he was an expert at Amazon. He ran Amazon Basics. And um, we, we built a whole business plan to uh, leverage his expertise, having been inside Amazon and my expertise coming up through the ranks on the 3P side. And we had a, a three-tiered uh, program to do the private label business. We had a, a vision for all the tools on Amazon and how to help people understand which tools would be best for them, kind of a CNET model. And uh, long story short, what went from sort of a, a slow transition into this, this new business um, got turned upside down a little bit when he decided at four years and one day to leave Amazon. And uh, it accelerated one leg of the stool in that he took his first vacation, I don't know, in four years and uh, started getting phone calls pretty much nonstop. Hey, can you help? Can you help? Can you help? 
And uh, we started to see there's a huge demand for people that had experience to um, help people find their way forward on Amazon. So we launched an agency um, and uh, having been through sort of the pain, which a lot of your listeners go through of trying to figure out what's the right path forward. Where do you make investments? How big do you go? How much risk do you want to take? Uh, honestly, the the appeal of getting paid to to share advice versus rolling the dice on um, <laughs> leveraging your house uh, <laughs> or your savings um, sort of won out, I would say. So um, I have a, I have a, a special place in my heart for the uh, the people that launch brands on Amazon, their passion for it, uh, and you know, as we grew our agency, we built uh, sort of a a playbook, if you will. We've seen. Uh, a pretty big range of brands, some that are, you know, fully VC funded that are going for broke. Um, some that are people that have full-time jobs like we did. And when we started and, and trying to build this thing and, and while they're, while they're staying in their, in their jobs. And um, we, we were pretty fortunate, I think, to uh, have great clients to um, operate under a, a, a very open and transparent um infrastructure with our brands, with our teams. And we built an agency, which then uh, we merged with another Amazon agency. Um, that merger came about because we, I mentioned earlier, we we didn't, you know, we I've tried basically every tool that's out there uh, to support Amazon sellers. And, and there's, there's pros and cons to everyone. We ended up building our own tool as well. And uh, the agency that we ended up merging with invested in that tool. And we sort of uh, drew straws and my business partner got the straw to go run the software business. So it made a lot of sense for the other three of us to merge and come together. Um, and it proved to be pretty fortuitous because uh, in in the same way as you see in business, when, when companies um, merge and grow or get acquired in the agency space, it can be a little bit hard to uh, go it alone and uh, not have size and scale to do things right. So we were fortunate then uh, when we merged um, and became Wingpoint, uh, we ran really hard for two or three years. And then Market Performance Group, uh, those guys, um, came to us uh, as they were growing. And, you know, you guys have a retail brick and mortar background as part of your, your history. Uh, MPG was really deep in, in that and in strategic consulting and, and our uh, depth and the size of our team for e-com really fit well for them. So it's been, it's been quite a journey. Um, we now manage, I think about 140 brands, about $2 billion of business on Amazon. And um, even though we're, you know, we're relatively uh, big, we're not, we're not, I would say we're like the, one of the largest agencies you've never heard of. We don't spend a lot of time tuning our own horn. Um, the history of MPG is pretty deep in CPG. So I think that's why you guys know a fair amount of uh, what we do. And um, I, I like to say, so my my role now is in, I'm in charge of the client services part of our business. So all the account managers um, that do battle with Amazon uh, day in and day out report up to me. And we have a pretty uh, pretty broad bench of, of services now. We do, we have a big media team. We do, we do performance marketing, um, which would be things like uh, sampling, influencer marketing, social. Um, we do cost recovery for larger brands. Uh, Amazon is pretty good at taking dollars and hiding them. <laughs> so we we sort of approach all of the things that we do is with, can we do it ourselves? And if not, can we find a best-in-class partner, usually a tech partner to bring that to our brands and add value? Um, and so anyway, that's my background. Uh, it's uh, I like to say that the only um, constant at Amazon is change. So um, it's it's a little interesting to see every single day you wake up. That's what keeps me going in the morning. Is like you know what's today's challenge or, or opportunity. So before Tracy kicks it off, basically, Jason, you've been doing nothing since you graduated. You've been sitting around and, you know, not really, <laughs> not really deep into it or much of an entrepreneurial spirit. No, that's quite yeah. a background. Tracy, kick it off. Well, Jason, you just uh, were uh, gave us a great segue into our first question, which is 
you know, how has Amazon changed from 2010 to, you know, today? So just share with you our with our audience today your insights and how it's how it's really changed and what's different. Yeah, sure. Uh it's a good thing to to ask about Tracy that I mentioned my friend back in 2010. Um I would say back then if you had um confidence or cash and could really go for it, it was pretty easy to make 10 million dollars. Um and I'm not even I'm not exaggerating. If you if you knew how to pick a product and could create a beachhead, I think of things like um French press uh water bottles this this particular guy he sold um like digital tire gauges and cherry pitters and he i don't know if you remember those um infused water bottles that were the, all the craze back then he was the first mm-hmm. guy in there and um once you back then there was less competition and more opportunity and amazon uh hadn't necessarily figured out how to monitor people so it was kind of like the wild west um you know, when we talk to brands, we counsel them a lot on uh, what I would call white hat to black hat marketing techniques. And we try and keep them in the in the white hat end of the spectrum. Some of them say, I don't care. I, I want to go for it. And we we generally don't work for them anymore. But back in the day, uh, it was pretty wide open. So you could get thousands of reviews. You could you could trick the system to get organic search rank and relevancy and it would stick. OK. Uh, as you come through, like uh, when I when I got in the in the mix of it all, you know, in addition to um, I would say a pretty decent work ethic, I I did training. Um, I actually hired a, a sort of a guru coach. I was one of lots of people that used this guy, uh, and really like dug into how the system worked and and what was legit about um, what you can and can't do. Like I said before. And um, I think in 2010, there might've been a million and a half three-piece sellers. I think there's close to 5 million now. Wow. And um, so it's it's much harder to find something that's new, something that's different. Uh, you know, if you are going to get on Amazon and sell, I don't know, readers, right? And you're just going to buy readers from China you're standing behind all of the other people that have already done that, that have a beachhead that that have organic relevancy. And the thing I always tell people that want to get into the business is, can you differentiate? Can you compete on price? What's what's something new that you can bring to the table? Um, You know, the, the, the shift from say 10 or even five or even three years ago, the biggest shifts are um, number of sellers Amazon's control of price, which we could talk about if you want. And then really uh, the pay to play nature of the infrastructure. If you, if you were to go back and the, there's a, there's a cool website that doesn't work for Amazon called the Wayback machine. You can type in any website and go see what it looked like over time. Um, the search results page on the, any search you do on Amazon used to have, I don't know, one to three sponsored placements and 20 results a page. It's now, depending on the category, uh, in some categories, there's the the top banner, which is called sponsored brands, used to be called headline search. Then there's paid placements below that. Then there might be only three organic placements. Then it's like highly recommended, also run by Amazon. Highly rated, run by Amazon. More organic search, paid search. It's like the, the amount of organic placement, which you there's a whole bunch of strategy to win for. It's just less of the real estate. So that means it costs more to compete, right? Because you have to pay to get on the page. Very intentional by Amazon. And um, again, used to be you could throw X amount of dollars, build your organic rank and back off your marketing spend and gain margin. <clears throat> it's harder to do that now. Sorry if that was kind of long-winded, but- No, um, that was good. So, so no, Jason, good. you you kind of wandered into it, but let's just go there. So all the- smaller emerging challenger brands and you know brands can be something the three of us think up it can be a very regional brand it could be a a brand bought out of a larger company that's been dormant and i i can't tell you how many times uh tracy and i hear you know we have 
unbelievable upside at Amazon. And I'm like, mm, probably not what you're thinking. So can you can you walk through sort of in super simple language the difference between 1P and 3P selling and kind of what the two or three triggers would be? So it's like, hey, if you want to do 1P, these are two or three things that are good about it. And these are the bad ones. Because a lot of people, their first question to us is, you know, do you know anyone who can help us on Amazon? And should I go 1P or 3P? Sure. Um, this doesn't really answer your question, but it's pretty hard to get into to 1P regardless these days. But um, the biggest, so so 1P is your traditional wholesale model, like you would go into a retailer where Amazon buys your product uh, and you invoice them and they pay you a wholesale price. There are program terms, which vary by category. Um, they vary quite a bit. And that's basically paying like, they call it co-op, which is um, basically give us extra margin. They don't, they claim they do stuff with it, but they don't. There's a, a freight allowance, a damage allowance, uh, because in, in the 1P, they take, they eat all the returns. And again, those vary by the data that they have by category. And then they try and get you to pay for something called retail merchandising, which would be what they call high value placements on the site. Um, and again, most start startup brands uh, probably aren't gonna get into that part of it anyway, because it's a pretty big investment. So the, the other part of it is on 1P, Amazon controls price because they own your product. Mm -hmm. So if you're selling product in other channels, mm -hmm. um, they monitor the other channels and they have this sort of zealous um, goal to have the lowest price. Uh, the irony, of course, is that if they drop the price and it hurts their net PPM, which is their net pure profit margin, um, they come back to you and say, hey, you have to you have to sell it to us for less, even though we lowered the price because uh, we're not making enough money. So um the advantages of 1P would be that it, it says shipped and sold by Amazon, which uh, it can help conversion. It doesn't always. Um, you get the Prime badge, which means Prime shipping, which is not exclusive to 1P, but it is always on 1P. Um, and so it's a uh, it, it's a perceived benefit. I would say, again, changes over time. 10 years ago, there were a bunch of programs available only to 1P sellers. Uh, as as Amazon has really kind of pushed people to 3P, they've slowly started giving data metrics and marketing placements, things like that to 3P sellers as well. So the the delta between 1P and 3P has, has um, shifted or shrunk, I would say. 3P, uh, which is a third party seller, is, is sort of bifurcated into two options. Um, it, regardless of the options, the brand owns the product until it's sold. So there's FBA fulfilled by Amazon, where you, the brand, ship product into an Amazon fulfillment center in FC, and they ship it for you to the consumer. And then there's FBM fulfilled by merchant, where when an order comes in, you ship it yourself. Both of those are 3P. Um, sorry, sorry. I was just going to say, are you... Are you aware in all the years you've been doing this, are there certain types of products that are just better? You know, and I understand 1P is getting tougher to get into. 3P yeah. versus 1P. I mean, are bigger, expensive, heavy stuff better to go 3P or, or, or uh, you know, yeah, there, yeah. there's a lot of the price to weight ratio to make e-com even work. So interested in your perspective there. Yeah. So if you leave out the uh, option of which channel, uh, there's a few I said guideposts. If you're heavy and cheap or big and cheap, it's really hard to make money on 3P. Uh, so ideally, you know, if you sell um, suntan lotion, right? They don't look heavy, but they're, they, you know, a, a, a big jar of suntan lotion or uh, like drinks and things like that. Uh, take, a, you know, you might sell a six pack of, of, you know, I don't know, uh, thinking of one of our clients is 1P, I almost said their name, um, of a health drink. Uh, you you can't sell that for $25 and make any money easily on 3P, right? So we have a client that's a startup, um, but they're VC funded, so they're willing to go for it. And they sell body wash and shampoo and things like that. And we end up doing very deep dives into their P&L 
to identify they're a 3P seller, they have not been invited to 1P, what price point do you have to get to where you can make money packaging the product, shipping it to Amazon, having them ship it and sell it, and then factoring in your marketing cost? And so it's a really important um, lever or, or exercise to go through when you're trying to figure out what your assortment should be. So that's a general rule. The other thing I would say is it's really hard to make money under $20. So if you're a small brand starting out, the, the, the dream scenario is low cost, lightweight, not too big, ASP over 20 bucks. Um, when I started out, I sold rocks glasses. I should have should have grabbed some of them <laughs> anyway. Um, and uh, I, I guess I can say this because I don't sell them anymore. I bought a set of two rock glasses, landed in my warehouse for three bucks, sold them for 20. Mm-hmm. Barely made money. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, right out of the gate, I made a lot of money, but as the, the cost and the competition of advertising grew, it became harder and harder. And then you have return costs. And there's a lot of uh, other costs in 3P that can really bite you uh, if you're not paying attention to them. And um, so I moved upstream to sell backpacks because they were 40 bucks and 50 bucks and also pretty efficient cost wise. Um, they cost more to ship and store. But, you know, again, it uh, the just the economics of 3P um, started to come and uh, rear its head. So I should also you I mean, I can tell you some of the other costs if you're curious storage costs at Amazon um, where they they store your product in their warehouses it used to be like send it to us we'll store it forever now they do two things for q4 which is their busiest time they jack the rates up both for storage and for shipping and um it used to be that like over a year they would do they would increase your storage fees long-term storage fees and they've been cranking that down it's now down to 180 days and it graduates up from, from like reasonable storage and they do it i think in 30 day increments Every time you get closer to 180 days, the price jumps and it's like a, like, I don't know, like a city water bill where they're like, you really don't want to have this here. We're going to make it really painful for you. And it jumps up exponentially. Wow. Um, so we actually had a brand earlier mm-hmm. this year that had a sub $10 paper product that um, they had it like high volume. And they, they went from having maybe f- making this up $300 in storage a month to $5,000 when this inflection hit at 180 days. So grief. Yeah. Well, so, so, so two things before we kick it to Tracy, Jason, $20 is kind of the magic number. If if you're not selling for at least 20, life is going to be hard. And like uh, since business started hundreds of years ago, excess margin attracts competition. Yeah, and, and I'll I'll say one other thing. When it comes, you think about the twenty dollars, um, the fees, the big picture, the fees for being a third party seller, there's a referral fee that's just the pay to play on Amazon, which depends on category. It's eight to fifteen percent. There's a couple categories in between. Um, there's for super small and light. There's some that are less, but pretty much eight to fifteen percent. And then there's your FBA fee if you're shipping at FBA. The cost to ship it, pick pack and ship to the customer, storage replacements, returns, a few other things. A, a good round number is on, on a 20 to $30 product is about 30% of your ASP. Um, wow. If you, if you can get a hundred dollar product, you can kind of start to squeeze that 30 down to 20, right? And in some cases, if you have a consumer electronics product with an 8% referral fee, you can get to 15 Right. If it's, you know, if you're selling like a, um, a phone case that's 80 bucks, but weighs nothing. So that's kind of the landscape. Yep. Tracy. Yeah. So Jason, talk to us about the importance of, of really having a plan, a strategic plan when a brand is looking to, you know, get their product listed on Amazon versus some brands we see where they just think that they can wing it kind of, uh, build the plane as it's going in the air. So yeah, talk to us a little bit about a strategic plan and its importance. Yeah, I think the first thing to do is do a lot of research. Um, There's great tools out there like Helium 10, um, Managed by Stats, Jungle Scout. We actually use all of them. 
Uh, and, and one of the things you can get from a tool like Helium 10 is um, search volume, demand for a product. Forget competition, they actually have that too. So you, let's say, you know, let's go back to backpacks, for example. Um, you can type in kids backpack or some search term, and it'll tell you how many people search for that product per month. It'll wow. also tell you uh, the number of competitors for the, the keyword. And you can, I think, I'm pretty sure it also tells you organic competitors versus paid, how many people are paying to go win in that space. And there's a lot of amazing uh, information available there. Um, and so before you, you know, you wade in, it's probably good to understand what's the competitive landscape look like. And so, hey, hey, Tracy, one, one second, please. So, Jason, when you talk about Helium 10 and Jungle Scout, for our listeners, in your opinion, is one of those a little more intuitive and simple to use, or do you have to, you know, be work with Elon Musk to understand how to get the info out of it? Uh, so it's funny you say that. I was I was online. Uh, I did. I was in the the marine industry in two thousand, selling boats on the internet. And so my favorite thing is uh, easy is a relative term. So the op brokers didn't really know how to turn on a computer. So I don't want to I don't want to say easy because I've lived in this stuff my entire life. But I would just say, relatively speaking, um, they have good. Both of them have good training tutorials, um, and the they have good support. So if you if you can follow directions, you can run yourself through and probably in three days be better than average. Um, yeah. you know, the only thing is like they keep stacking in new features. So you got to if you stay in the core features. And don't try and learn the whole thing. Uh, it's it's less less daunting, I would say. Well, I imagine uh, yachts are expensive, but they are heavy and probably tough to fit yeah. in a mailbox. So that would yeah. have been, that would have been interesting. Tracy, did you have more there before we press on? No, that was great. That was uh, great, Jason. That was just uh, perfect. It's just uh, crazy how uh, Amazon has just changed so much, and it sounds like they're taking a playbook from brick and mortar retailers who are jacking up their fees and their slotting and all that. So somehow somebody gave them the, the playbook from a from well, side. So, so I, if, I, if I may add two other things quickly, one yeah, is sure. um, once you, once you determine there's a market and you want to go after it and maybe there's a niche for you, something you can bring a differentiated approach to in addition to the normal fees, you need to add in uh, marketing costs Right. And I think people underestimate how much it costs as, you know, from a dilution perspective on their business to go win. Now, if you're already in retail or you have like some huge social media following, people are going to end up on Amazon anyway. It's easier to say, oh, I'm going to go put it on Amazon and maybe it will succeed. OK, uh, to your point, Tracy, slotting fees and so forth at retail, it's a little bit of pay to play. And there's only right. so much space in a retail footprint for your product. So if you get X amount of feet on Y shelf, retailers are pretty good at telling you what your sell through is going to be. Okay. Um, that's a, it's an opportunity and a, and a challenge where it's hard to get in, but once you're in, you can kind of project how you're going to do. Amazon is an open aisle. So anybody yeah. can do it. And don't get me started about the rogue three P sellers once you're successful. Right. But just out of the beginning, we tell people, if you're trying to build a brand, you're talking about like an investment of 25% margin, total dilution just for marketing. So then you're you're starting to get to 55%, which is kind of that retail number that you probably have to yeah have to exactly in retail yeah. So yeah. so so Jason, as we as we go on further here, when you and I spoke uh, before you came on the show, you had an interesting point. Uh, about the uh, small brands thinking about going on to Amazon, you said a key thing they have to determine is, do you need to make money from day one or can you play a bit of the longer game? So I'd, I'd love it if you could elaborate on that a bit. And then also kind of the uh, pot of gold, hopefully at the end of the rainbow, although the pot may be smaller than people think, how do people actually get paid? You know, does does Bezos sure. send a drone to your house? <laughs> you know, you get cool, a huh? gift card? <laughs> <laughs> gift card, yeah. Amazon gift card. That'd be super, no, that part's no good. But um, yeah, so so I'm going to do it backwards if that's okay to you. So Please. The, the, sure. the, um, the mechanism, the cool part about 3P is that you get paid every two weeks. Uh, so they take your revenue less your 
uh, all the fees and the marketing if you deduct it from from your sales and they cut you a, a you know EFT right into your bank account every two weeks. Um, they do hold back some of that money every two weeks because they um, they see it as a uh, they, they do a risk analysis of your business and say, uh, oh well, we're concerned that maybe you won't pay your bills or that. Uh, there might be returns. So sometimes sellers get frustrated if they sold $10,000 and they had $4,000 of fees, they don't get six. They might get four, right? Oh, and if wow. you're growing really fast, Amazon holds back more money because it freaks out about it. So is that 1P or 3P? I'm sorry. That's 3P. 3P. 1, 1P, you get paid 30 days or depends on your terms, 30 to 60 days after uh, you invoice them. Okay. Yep. And um, so your other question was, was remind me, how do you make money? It, no, no, no. The, the question you and I had discussed was one of the things a brand needs to consider. Oh, is, oh yeah. Do yeah, you need yeah, to risk, make right. money day one yeah. or can I play the long game? Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. So it's funny. Um, I mentioned that that company we worked with that was VC funded. Um, they had a tech solution that was differentiated. Really, really great solution. Um, and they were going for it. Okay. So they called us and they said, Hey, we want to go win in this space. Nobody has what we have. And we need to, they invested big time in social. Um, and this is four years ago when people still spent a bunch of money on Facebook before the iOS change. Um, and we took them from zero to $5 million in like 10 months, maybe 12. And, but they were spending like crazy. Okay. They were spending hundreds of thousands of dollars a month just off Amazon uh, to build uh, awareness, right? And um, on the flip side, you have brands, uh, happens every, every week. So just talk to a uh, husband and wife founder of a skincare product. They're just getting started and um, they have full-time jobs. Uh, they built this product out of frustration, which is a lot how a lot of really successful businesses are sure. started. We hear it all the time. Yep. Yep. And uh, they came to us and they said, people love our products. It's, they're the best thing ever. And we have this great story. We're <laughs> doctors. We, we And you guys have probably heard this a bunch of times. And they're amazing people. And um, they do have a great story to tell. I think the gap is like, how? what's their commitment? So either they have to do it themselves, which they don't have time for. Or they need to hire an agency or hire a person out of college. There's a big range of how you might want to go to market just, and so there's an expense and overhead for that. Right. And then, then the question is, how do you win? What does it cost to win? So I went to my team and I said, well, in a skincare category like this, they want to know what's going what it's going to take to, to win. And, and uh, my media team said $30,000 a month. Wow. Um, is what we would do to go try and win in AMS and DSP. Uh, Amazon marketing services is paid search. DSP is programmatic most people don't, don't get into prog programmatic right out of the gate um and they should also make sure they're investing let's say forty five thousand dollars in the first few months in social capital let's call it influencer marketing you can imagine they said what you said tracy their eyes wide open <laughs> you know? and, oh, wow. and so to your point bruce we had a conversation which is like who do you want to be um if if you if that's too much for you to like stomach, fine. But let's set expectations about what your growth might look like. So if you if you have five thousand a month for marketing or ten, it's going to be different than thirty, right? You're going to learn. One of the things that happens when you spend a lot of money is you get a lot of data, so you can start to say like, oh, where should I? And, and you can get the data anyway at less at a lower investment. It just takes longer to get there, right? Uh, and so. I said, if you want, if you want to make money or try to like break even, you're uh, going to have to, you know, have a longer term view. And um, all of that aside, if your reviews are no good, doesn't matter. You're done. Yeah. Right. Yeesh. So, um, you know, and it used to be like ten years ago, if you had, you know, there were ways to get two hundred reviews in a day. Which you can't do anymore <laughs> without getting caught. I'll go ahead. Yeah. So just so the folks know, 
Jason's been good enough to uh, give Tracy and myself a, a second episode where we're going to get into the marketing and demand creation, the importance of reviews. But today, today we're largely focused on, you know, what the heck even is Amazon? How do I do this? 1P, 3P. So Jason, before people go, what the heck? You didn't even ask him what exactly to do. We're going to, but yeah. uh, we want to be cognizant of, of his time and everyone else's. So kind of, Jason, as we head around third base here for this episode, how does a brand even begin to get set up on Amazon? Aside calling you and, yeah, and yeah. having you sure. give it to one of your minions uh, to walk them yeah, through yeah. it. The people that insist on uh, trying to do things themselves, you know, what's the process, the brand sure. registry, what's yep. an ASIN? Yeah, yeah. What'd you call me? Exactly. Yeah, so, so um, it's worth saying that like, it's almost impossible to get one P now. Um, there's something Amazon's doing called, they've been doing it for seven or eight years called hands off the wheel. They're trying to move everything to third party because they don't have to own the content or own the material. Um, I think their, their perfect state is you own it. We control the price, but that's a whole different podcast. Um, so seller central is the third party infrastructure. Um, you can go to sellercentral.amazon.com and register. It's actually pretty easy to register to start. But there's some things you want uh, to set things up correctly. There, if you're serious, you need to have a professional account because there's not much in the in the sort of base account. It's only forty dollars a month to be a pro seller on Amazon, and uh, in a best case scenario, you will have uh, you'll own a trademark. Uh, without a trademark, there's you're you're pretty limited yeah. in your ability to tell your brand story. You know, if you if you if you break it down. The elements of selling on Amazon are uh, product pages. They're called PDPs, product display pages. And then right underneath your title, you'll see it on Amazon. A lot of people don't even click on it. There's a brand name. That brand name goes to a store that you can control. But if you don't have brand registry, which requires a trademark, you can't build a store. Uh, the, the brochure at the bottom of a PDP is called A+. No trademark, no brand registry, no A plus. So it's a pretty important element to have um, your trademark. Now, we launch people that don't have it. Um, again, if they have reasonable expectations, uh, you can sell product. But but really having a plan together, I think you mentioned it earlier, Bruce. Of like, what are the the core blocking and tackling that you need in a perfect world? You'll have brand reg. You'll have really good content. Uh, that means. Uh, we call it the digital carousel, the pictures on the side of the listing or on the bottom of the listing, the, the carousel images. Uh, these days, we've we've done all kinds of studies. I've actually put Latin in the in the product description in the bullets. People don't read, so they read the title, and then you have to you have to hook them in the first three images. So we do a lot of work with brands to tell their story digitally through the the carousel. That that is text overlay, which is show your image. And don't just list features. You have to say, what's the benefit? Why should you choose my product versus somebody else's? You need to do that in text overlay, both in product shots. And if you have the ability to do it, lifestyle images, make people like understand how it's going to change their life or be great for them. And literally you can do it with scissors. You can do it with anything. Okay. And then you will have a video, at least one video, uh, those are sort of the core elements that that you need to have, and um, what we there again, I don't want to put too fine of a tip on it, but the, when you launch a product, from the second you turn it on, the Amazon A9 algorithm, which is their search engine, um, starts to analyze your listing, and the better you have SEO optimization in your titles and in the in the keywords are indexed in the in the way you structure your listing, the more organic relevance you get. And Amazon gives you extra weighting right when you start. So ideally, you have it all lined up before you really go for it. Now, practically speaking, uh, you know, our uh, our studio team that does all of our content is like, they must have everything before they start. Life gets in the way, right? You don't have the yeah. money to do it. You want to get going. So you need to have a plan and you need to understand maybe the, the, the trade-offs between pushing hard to get started uh, and skipping some steps, which is totally fine, happens literally every day, and uh, you know, doing it in the sort of quote unquote best way possible. That's Holy awesome. 
holy cow, my head hurts after all that. And and um, to your point, we're working with a client right now and we're living exactly what you said. And we'll get into this in episode two, like what happens if some other joker has s- snagged your brand registry? I mean, the, the pain and suffering to go through to prove it's yours. And we are going to torture you next episode, Jason, to talk about uh, rogue three P sellers, but or third party sellers, but not today. Tracy, anything else for Jason on your end before we head? No, to the I don't finish? think so. This has been great, Jason. Just a wealth of knowledge and insight, and I know our uh, small emerging brand uh, audience is going to going to love this episode, and I know they're going to look forward to the 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 next episode. So, um, as the big finish, as Bruce said, this please follow us. Um, on our road to retail, we're available on Spotify, we're available on iTunes, and then of course on our LinkedIn page. And look forward to uh, posting this episode soon and talking to uh, Jason again on episode two. So stay tuned. Hey, Jason, if anyone uh, wanted to get in touch with you, what's the best way? Giving out your yeah. home phone number, if you still have a landline, that would be great. Yeah, uh, most of my people we work with don't know what that is. Um, yeah. at the risk of, I'm going to follow my, uh, my fearless leader, the other Jason down the road of, I don't, I, I get so much email, so I'm going to put it out there. My cell phone, um, text me. I will answer you. If you email me, it's going to get lost. So, uh, because you guys are great, I'll hand out my, my cell. We'll see if anybody's actually, you know, crazy enough to text me 206 206- Seven nine five six one three five. I I love talking to people about this stuff. It's actually the fun part of my job. And um, if if I can be of help, I mean, even if we don't actually sign people, I just love talking to people because I'm an entrepreneur. So um, I understand where people are coming from and, and happy to help. Great. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Jason. And as Tracy said, we'll be back for episode two when we'll talk about more of the specifics of the Amazon marketing services, etc. But thank you so much and good luck out there, folks. Thanks, everybody. Thanks,